Hey guys, welcome to the InsideSoCal.com slash UCLA video blog. This is John Gold, Los Angeles Daily News beat writer, joined by Los Angeles Daily News uh, intern Sam Strong and also Daily Bruin beat writer. Uh, here we are on Tuesday practice over at Spalding Field talking about UCLA's small win over San Jose State and what very uh, small. Very, you know, 10 point 27 17 win over San Jose State uh, and their big matchup coming up with Texas, rematch of their 34 12 win last year at Texas. Uh, you know, Sam obviously. 27-17 to the media, to the fans, to everyone was a letdown. I mean, we, you know, I projected a bigger win. I know you did. I know, you know, everyone following this Vegas, team. Vegas did. Vegas did. Three touchdown, you yeah. know, yeah. favorites going into the game. I think everyone kind of expected a little more than, than we saw. How much of that do you think was just the team not, you know, not performing well and not really delivering how they should have? And how much do you think is fundamental issues with this with this team? I think a lot of it was uh, overconfidence, maybe overlooking okay. San Jose State, even though no one in that post-game locker room would admit no one's that. that. Uh, New Heisel wouldn't admit it, which is fine. I understand you know, what you're trying to do with the program. But um, that that was definitely a little bit of, uh, I don't want to say cockiness, but yeah, taking, I, I, taking know, a I team. Didn't, I didn't get that vibe at all. I, didn't, I really don't think it was, they, I, I thought they practiced, you know, they, they practiced poorly at the end of Tuesday, but, but for the most part they were okay. Um, I thought... But taking a team that hadn't won a game against an FBS team in three years. I don't I, mean, I think it was more execution and lack that lack thereof than them overlooking San Jose okay. State. I thought okay. they just played poorly. I, you know, I don't think I don't get the vibe from this team that they were overconfident going into the game. We didn't hear much about that. You know, all we heard all week was we have to be better than we were week one, we have to be better than we were they week one. They weren't better than they were. They week were one. in a lot of ways they were worse. And and I think it was more about just, you know, they're not practice the the, the way that they practice in, on the practice field does not translate, I think, well to Saturdays. They don't tackle much. Part of that is because they don't tackle. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, and, you know, every coach has, has his own thing, and Rick Lanzel has, has his practice plans, and we're all okay. You know, we all understand that's what, that's what he does and everything, but I think you're, what you're seeing is a team that lacks that, that extra, I don't know, that extra physicality that you need at the Division One level, even against a team like San Jose State. Okay, so second half adjustments, physicality, whatever. They give the ball to Derek Coleman. He carries the ball 14 times, 16 yeah. times in the second half. Yeah. Has 130 some 14. odd yards. 14, my bad. Franklin had 16. Right. Has 130 something yards, yeah. and I'm sitting there in the press box going, "Why didn't Derek Coleman see a carry in the first half?" Well, Derek Coleman was coming off a game in which he averaged two yards a carry, uh, whereas Jonathan, whereas Jonathan Franklin averaged eight yards a carry. So going into the game, I understand wanting to favor Franklin more, sure. but it's not like they favored Franklin more. They just weren't running the ball that much, nor to that to, to much success. And in the second half, once they committed to the run, and once they really committed to not just the run, but to meaningful running. And there's a difference then, you know, there's a difference to me between, yeah, we're going to try and run it on first and second down, and then throw it and run, you know, whatever. It's a it's a concentrated effort to be more physical than the other team. Okay, but, but Neuheisel was saying. We saw some things downfield that we didn't capitalize on, and that's why we weren't running the ball as much, is because we thought we could get their safety to buy and things like that. Yeah. But I think you talked about this on your blog. The options downfield are Nelson Rosario, and that's about it. So I don't get that. That's one I wanted to bring up to you is why aren't we seeing Shaq Evans? Why aren't we seeing Randall Carroll? Why aren't we seeing you know some varied threats deep? If you yeah. if you are indeed going to try and go over the top that much, it can't be Nelson Rosario to try and come up with a sports center top play every every time. Every time. And that you know that to me has probably offensively been the biggest question mark and the biggest surprise to me, because you know we went through fall camp and we watched every single day another receiver step up. You know we watched Devin Lucian push Randall Carroll. Randall Carroll pushed Josh Smith. Josh Smith, you know, pushed Ricky Marbre. And by the end of camp, I didn't see a huge differential between these no. six guys, you know, Nelson Osario obviously, you know, physical, physical specimen, talent-wise, probably going to have a leg up on uh, just about any receiver he's, he's on the field with, but, you know, th does he go after it on every play? No. Does he fight for the ball sometimes? No. You know, and so... Marbury has been moved to F back, I think. Yeah, I mean, the, he's... They he's have a no non-factor. Yeah, he's a non-factor, and, and like I said, you know, after two weeks of fall camp, we thought there were six guys who were interchangeable. And I think they really need to delete, you know, they need to find that second deep threat. It can't just be Fourier over the middle. It can't just be Nelson Rosario on one of those freak fluky, you know, highlight plays. It's got to be a more concentrated effort to look down for We heard all during camp that this team's the deepest Rick Newhouse has ever had. Uh, and I think they're getting a fair amount of rotation on defense. Yeah. But 
the offensive depth and, and moving guys in and out and, and giving guys different looks is, isn't there. Uh, haven't seen haven't seen the personnel packages we no, thought we'd see. You know, not at all. those kind of specific unique packages where you have a Jordan James at F back, you have a Franklin running back, you have Carroll Smith and Marv, you know, the, the really fast guys or whatever at receiver. Instead, it's almost like it's it's Nelson and Shaq Evans or Nelson and Ricky, Nelson and Taylor, or Nelson. You, know, you and I were just talking about this. These starters, these Sean Westgates, Aaron Hester's, Sheldon Price's, can't be thought of as untouchables. They're, this team, won four, long this team won four games last year. We've so. seen that a long time at UCLA, and you're absolutely right on that. And that, to me, is probably, you know, we're talking about the offensive, the, the lack of offensive, you know, personnel packages. That, that, I really didn't expect that going into this year. Just to be honest, it's, it's not what we saw in fall camp. It's not what we saw in spring camp. But, you know, you have two new, you have two new coordinators who are, you know, coming in and, and doing their whole new thing. Sorry, you know, if we're not watching the, the tape the whole time, we're watching practice in the background a little bit. But, you know, it's, it's really surprising to me just how much those starters have locked down their positions when, okay, but, like but, you said, 4-8 and eight, and then you lose to Houston week one. Right, regardless of what's happened, this week, two th- uh, noon 30 in the Rose Bowl, 12.30, whatever. It's going to be noon, noon, noon 30. 30. Yeah. The first person in the history of the world to call anything noon 30. <laughs> yeah, I fell asleep at midnight 45 last night. I was exhausted. Come 12.30 at the Rose Bowl on Saturday afternoon, we're going to find out if they've made adjustments in terms of depth. Yeah. Because Eric Kendricks led the team in tackles yes. and he was is playing the same good. spot as Sean Westgate. Yeah. So, to me, if Eric Kendricks gets in the game a lot, I'm going to you know commend Joe Tracy for seeing that sort of depth and, and seeing that if Eric Kendricks makes seven tackles, Sean Westgate's getting a little breather on the sideline and he's that much more fresh coming into the game. You know, and obviously the big question, Mark, and, and talking about rotation, talking about depth and all that kind of stuff, is a quarterback, uh, Kevin Prince coming back from a shoulder sprain and a concussion. Uh, New Isle said he was going to play against San Jose State, doesn't play a snap. New <laughs> Isle's not very good at keeping those he's going to play from. Yeah, it's uh, not his forte. No. But, you know, so you have a you have a quarterback situation that, that borders on, you know, <laughs> confusion, not borders on confusion, is once more a confusing heat, you know. Yeah. And, and yeah. now Texas appears to be going with two quarterbacks, uh, with Case McCoy and David Ash. Uh, at this point, and I think that we can all kind of agree on this, media fans, players, everyone alike, they, they just need someone to not just become the quarterback, but to make it no doubt. And they haven't seen that at the quarterback spot. The time for evaluation and seeing what we've got and all that sort of stuff needs to be done. It's we they've been in camp since August 8th. Yeah. So and these aren't new guys. You know, these are <laughs> exactly fourth and third year guy. You know what you, you know have, what you have with Richard Reno. You know what you have with Kevin Prince. You need to say which one's going to give me a better chance to win every game, not just this upcoming game. And that's, pick one and go. That's to the point. The newness and all that sort of thing is, is yeah. That's not an excuse anymore. It's not even a. It's not even a factor. Sam, anything else going into to week three against Texas? Uh, Revenge factor. I mean, how, how big do you think that's going to be? I don't think very much. I, I think Texas has a whole new offense and a whole new defense as well. Yeah. You know, they have they have some of the quarterback same issues back, too. But they have quarterback issues. Malcolm and Brown getting out going into the front. Yeah. Yep. Starting lineup. I I, I do. I don't want to discount the revenge factor whole idea. Uh, but I think that's going to be more for UCLA to live up to. I, I don't think that Texas is going to be bringing the heat, you know, like in some kind of crazy weird way. I think this is more about UCLA understanding and Texas, you know, what it, what it has to do to, to up their level of intensity. Because we haven't seen that in intensity yet. Texas will have no problem getting up for a road game, especially in a half-empty Rose Bowl, because they played in the national title game. A lot of these players played in the national title game three years ago. Yeah. So I see no problem with with Texas not being ready for this game or anything. I, I think uh, UCLA's got to be ready. The best team can win. Yeah, you're absolutely right, uh, guys. Thanks so much for watching. This is the InsideSoCal.com/slash UCLA video blog. Hopefully, going to make this a weekly thing. Uh, we're just two fat guys talking football. We tried to do this last week at Houston, <laughs> but. It was a jumbled mess, and you know, my collar was all over the place, Sam's hair, and <laughs> he was wearing like a fruit hat. I mean, it was ridiculous. Uh, but we'll, we'll be back next week, probably more fat than we are this week. Yeah, I can guarantee that. Thanks so much for watching, guys. John Gold, Sam Strong. Thanks.